Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Susan Posner. I'm the provost here at UIC, and I want to welcome you all to the campus conversation, uh, the first one of the academic year. Let me say first that um, I left a somehow the back page of my introductory remarks are somewhere on my kitchen table. So I'm, I'm actually reading this off my phone, which you might think is cool, but I'm not sure I can do it. So this may go a little. <laughs> um, so the goal of the Campus Conversation Series is to have faculty, students, and staff engage with each other about some of the big issues of our time going on now and affecting all of us. As a community dedicated to social justice and diversity, we come together to try to understand current events and talk about the issues. Over the past three years, we have looked at issues such as immigration, civil rights, national and local elections, and the hashtag MeToo movement. Upcoming programs for this academic year include social media and mental health, food insecurity, free speech on campus, climate change, and Mayor Lightfoot's first year in office. Today, the topic is closer to home, the general education program at UIC. The Gen Ed program is comprised of over 400 classes, most offered by the College of Liberal Arts and Sciences, that fall under six broad categories. In order to graduate, students must take at least one class from each of these six categories, and a total of at least 24 credit hours from the list of courses. The six categories are as follows. Analyzing the natural world, understanding the individual and society, understanding the past, understanding the creative arts, exploring world cultures, and understanding US society. The purpose of this program, as described in the catalog, is that it, and I quote, provides students with a breadth of exposure to the academic disciplines and serves as the foundation for the knowledge, skills, and competencies essential to becoming well-educated college graduates and citizens. The general education program at UIC has a structure that is similar to most such programs. It creates a set of categories that are outcome-based. In other words, broad areas of knowledge and or skills that the faculty believe students should possess as college graduates. At the same time, the program allows students substantial freedom in choosing among classes within each of the six categories. Other universities pick different types and different numbers of categories, but for the most part, UIC's version of general education follows the structure of the vast majority of general education programs at big research universities in this country. It follows then, and is worth noting, that there is nothing fundamentally wrong with our gen ed program. It is very much in the mainstream, and as far as I know, we don't receive a lot of complaints about it. At least, if we do, I haven't heard them. However, there are two overarching reasons why I think it is time to take a look at UIC's general education program and to think hard about whether it is, in fact, providing, again, I quote, a foundation for the knowledge, skills, and competencies essential to becoming well-educated college graduates and citizens. And my two overarching reasons for this are as follows. First, the program is, as I said, very much in the mainstream, but UIC is not. We have one of the most diverse student bodies of any research university in the country, and this diversity is expressed in many ways, including race, ethnicity, religion, sexual orientation, socioeconomic status and background, residential versus commuter, and so forth. We have no racial or ethnic majority among our student body, which therefore looks like this country is going to look in about 25 years. This means that we are educating tomorrow's leaders, and we better be sure that we are doing right by them. The second reason for taking a look at our gen ed program is that the faculty began to create this program back in around 2003. That was when the last review began, I believe. And the world has changed a lot since then. That was the year that Mark Zuckerberg, Zuckerberg in his Harvard dorm room started what would become Facebook. 2003 is also before a lot of other now basic and some would say indispensable everyday technologies, like the iPhone invented in 2007, of course, that means all apps and Fitbits, YouTube, Google Maps, Uber, and the mainstreaming of online education, and Twitter. Most of our oncoming, incoming freshmen this year were born around 2001. So for all practical purposes, to them, 
9-11 is history, not lived experience, as it is for many of us on the teaching side. So it's time that we took a fresh look to see whether, in light of who our students are and the world that they grew up in, as well as the nature of the modern workforce, the current general education program is serving them in the very best possible way. We are at the very, very beginning of this process, with more details to follow soon. And I have not shared my thoughts about the process for going forward with this panel here. So please do not press them for information about that. They really don't have it. I've kept them happily ignorant. Last winter, I created a task force of faculty, most of whom are sitting here before you, and I asked them to do a brainstorming exercise without thinking too much about what was feasible and without attention to parochial concerns, particularly things like budget implications, where the tuition would flow. I gathered this group together, it's worth noting, by asking the deans and department heads and some other people for recommendations of people who are very open-minded, know something about the general education program, and would be able to have conversations without going back to parochial concerns of their own colleges or departments. I asked them then to think outside of the box about what a general education program could look like and to write up a narrative of the ideas that they discussed so that we could start this process by thinking big, maybe even thinking a little crazy, just as an idea generating exercise to get us started. The report they created, which is available on my website, although I am told, you, you go into my website and then you go to Box, I'm told that Box may be down right now, which we did not do on purpose, um, but it is there and you, you'll be able to find it hopefully now or very shortly. Um, so the, the report that they created followed these instructions and most of the task force, everyone who was able, is here today to talk with you about their discussions. I am unfortunately unable to stay for this session because of a commitment I made very many months ago that just simply through bad luck now conflicts exactly with this session. But this session is being streamed and recorded and I will view the entire event as soon as it is available in the next few days. So I'm now going to turn it over to Professor Layden, who, although at some level the chair of the task force, I think maybe would prefer to have been called the sort of coordinator. Um, call him what you will. Um, he's going to introduce the panel or have the panel introduce um, itself. There will be lots of opportunity for all of you to ask questions and to send comments by using the camera on your phone as explained in the sheet of paper that was on your chair when you came in. If you take a picture of that little square thing, whatever it's called, uh, you'll get you into a Google, a Google Doc and you can write down questions which we will then be able to pass on uh, to the panel if you'd rather do it that way. We also have a microphone um, here which you can utilize <coughs> as well. So I will turn this over to uh, Dr. Layden and the rest of the committee. Thank you again for being here and we very much look forward um, to your comments. Uh, uh, going forward. Thank you, Tony. Um, hi, everybody. Is this on? Can you hear me? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, so thanks for coming out uh, and joining in this conversation. Uh, what I thought I would do is say a brief, uh, very briefly, sort of what we did in our discussions, um, how I think uh, the report came together and what I think it maybe uses, uh, and then to uh, remind those of you who have read it and inform those of you who have not basically what's in it in terms of the sort of items in it. I'm not going to go into much detail because I'd like to open things up to a conversation. But if something intrigues you and you haven't read the report and want to know more, we're more than happy to fill in details. Um, and then I'll open it up to uh, my fellow task force members who can correct everything I said. Uh, and then we'll open it up to uh, conversation. I, don't, I won't say questions, but you can ask questions as part of the conversation. Um, so, as uh, Provost Poster said, uh, she gathered us together to um, think big about uh, general education. And so, over the course of last spring semester, we met five or six times over lunch for about two hours and uh, did something between brainstorming and deliberating. That is, we read some stuff to sort of get our uh, thinking going, and then we threw out ideas in somewhat structured ways, pursued some of them to some degrees. 
uh, to see what, which of them generated excitement amongst members of the task force, which of them uh, fell into obvious difficulties very, very quickly. Um, and we sort of recorded that as we went along, and then at the end of the semester, we gathered together what seemed to be the still living and interesting ideas uh, we had and, and uh, threw them down into this uh, report. Um, so you might ask, well, what's the point of pulling together these ideas that haven't been hugely vetted, uh, that were thought of by you know, 10 faculty members from around the university who have no particular authority to be determining the curriculum on their own, uh, and so forth. And here's uh, the way I think about it. I mean, I think anytime you want to make this kind of change in the curriculum and education at an institution this large, there are enormous inertial pressures to make it look pretty much like it's always looked, right? And if we want to avoid that, if we want to think deliberately and intentionally and well about what it might be to educate our students to the best of our abilities, um, unconstrained by the inertia, the institutional inertia that's there now, it helps to have some big ideas to sort of grab onto that aren't themselves built out of that uh, status quo um, to just jumpstart thinking in an interesting way and imagination and, and see where that goes. Um, and so I think of these ideas as ideas that are, if you started from any of these ideas, it would be hard to end up with a gen ed system that just collapsed back into what I think of as a redrawing of boundaries in the course catalog. That is, most gen ed programs, you take the course catalog as it exists, and then you just divide it up in, in a particular way according to some idea of, of divisions, and then say, you know, everybody has to take one from every box. But you don't do anything to the actual courses that are being offered, so you don't actually really affect the education you're offering our students. And so if we want to get past that idea and, and towards really rethinking what it is we're doing when we educate our students, it helps to have uh, things to grasp onto that aren't going to collapse back into that. And that's how I think of what the, these do. I'm not sure if my task force uh, colleagues agree, but anyway, that's one way to think about uh, this material. Um, And I'm, you know, it may be that we decide at the end of the day we don't want to do that. That is, that the, the effort in redesigning the nature of the kind of education we provide is either not worth doing or, in fact, would make it worse or is beyond our capacities. Um, but I think we should at least entertain the thought of what that would look like. Um, okay, so just out of curiosity, how many of you actually read this report? Uh, some, but not many. So let me try and give a, a quick summary of what's in it. Apart from saying at the beginning that we're just throwing out these ideas and uh, we hope they will generate conversation, um, it breaks into three set kinds of ideas. There are a set of suggestions about how we might think about the actual courses that make up a gen ed curriculum. Then there's some uh, discussions about how we might situate gen ed or some things that are less like gen ed within uh, UIC's overall structure, and then some thoughts about process going forward. So on the course side, the first two suggestions involve organizing courses around lists either of skills or capacities, um, and we had some discussion about what the difference is between them. Um, what I think is important is that both of those ways of thinking about what it is a course is designed to accomplish um, and teach is that they're different from subject matter or disciplinary approach or methods or the various kinds of things that generally lead to the recarving of the course catalog. Um, and so they're the kinds of things that aren't, right, teaching certain skills or certain capacities are not, I think, the primary aims of most of our courses when we teach undergraduate classes. We may do that on the side. We may be, think it's a really important thing to do, but I, my guess is most of us don't design our courses with that in mind as their primary goal. Um, so this would involve thinking differently about the kind of courses we offer in Gen Ed. Um, and I think, you know, that we can talk about the difference between skills and capacities, but I think that what matters about both ideas is that they're trying to avoid two things. One, on the one hand, dumbing down what it is we teach um, into some set of very small level things that uh, don't capture the depth and complexity of the kind of ideas and thinking we want to uh, inspire in our, our students. Um, but at the same time, they are meant to 
highlight some of the valuable things that we can and do teach that go beyond the subject matters we teach uh, and which in interesting ways cross disciplinary and divisional boundaries. Um, so to give you an example, uh, and I'll, I'll stick to something that I know because I'm a philosopher, um, you know, you might think that there's a skill in understanding, analyzing, and evaluating arguments. That's a skill that philosophy courses tend to teach well, but other courses do as well. And it's a useful skill outside of philosophy in life in many academic disciplines. And so we might think being able to do that is something we want our students to be able to do. Uh, and so we might think about what it, courses that look like that do that. You know, I think math courses oftentimes serve to teach students how to think about arguments very well. Um, or think about courses that teach students to think about intricate interrelated systems. You might find those in an environmental science course or a sociology course. Um, so that was, that's the first uh, suggestion is, is to think about uh, organizing courses that way. Then some more uh, particular ideas about that sort of intersect with those or, or uh, cut against them. Uh, one would be just to limit each category to a very, very small number of courses. I mean like three. Right, so it radically changes how we think about things. And the idea here would be that you would develop a course collaboratively amongst a, you know, 10 to 15 faculty member from a variety of colleges and, and disciplines. Um, again, if, and you can sort of see how this might work if we have skills or capacities as the aim of the course. And the course might have different sections and have different subject matters in those different sections, but aim at uh, covering some particular skill. Um, one way to do that would then to have you know, the different sections covering different subject matters then have a common exam where you had to demonstrate this skill of argument uh, analysis or systems thinking or what have you. Um, a very different model that we uh, played with was to make courses problem-based and team-taught. So take big intractable social problems, climate change, persistent poverty, um, the digital divide, and design courses that are meant to help students think about those issues from a variety of uh, disciplines. Um, connected to that was an idea that we uh, make some gen ed courses more like capstone courses. So you could imagine a, a system that involved some basic skill level courses that students would do in their first couple of years, and then they would spend a lot of time in their major, and then they would come together in a capstone course across majors that were problem based. Right, so you develop some expertise and then you get the philosopher and the sociologist and the climate and the environmental scientist and the engineer together uh, around a table to think about climate change. Um, and then another idea that comes up in that part of the report um, is to try and integrate study abroad or other immersive experiences into gen ed, whether to do that into every gen ed course or to have that be a gen ed category or, or requirement of its own. Uh, there's some issues there about costs and expenses and finding alternatives to actually going somewhere to have the same kind of immersive experience. Uh, after that, we turn to organizational matters, uh, and in one that I'm sure is going to be controversial, uh, we suggest the possibility of creating some sort of administrative unit that would oversee gen ed, um, a college, an office, a division. And I think here the idea is that if you're going to create a system that's really going to require the university to, and the faculty and the advisors and the administrators to work in ways that are fundamentally different than we have habitually worked before, that's going to require a fair amount of curating. And that's a full-time job. And so you would want a, somebody who comes from the faculty to do it, but I don't want to do that as overtime on my regular job, which means I don't want to do it as a committee assignment. Um, and it won't get done well as a committee assignment, right? It requires thinking about how these courses are taught, whether they're actually doing the right thing, what those courses look like, revising them, and so forth. And so creating an a administrative structure that would have full-time people involved in doing that might be one way of uh, keeping the system uh, functioning properly. Um, then we suggested two somewhat, I think, Radical alternatives, almost alternatives to gen ed, but you could imagine them maybe mixing in with a gen ed system. One is to, so there were some people who were worried about the pressure that in some majors students have to both complete their major and acquire all the skills and knowledge that the major requires and also do gen ed, which seemed like this side piece of their education. And so you might think about trying to allow departments to curate 
their students' ways through gen ed in a certain way. Uh, whether that would mean exempting them from some requirements or just directing them in a way that made sure that satisfying those requirements um, was done in a way that was also helpful for developing whatever it was the major was trying to teach. So that was one idea. And then another idea was to um, think not in terms of a gen ed system, but as an, a kind of system of paired majors and minors that would require, uh, as one of our my colleagues said, students to cross the campus. So you imagine that philosophy majors would have to do a minor in accounting or in um, kinesiology, and you'd make uh, students in applied health sciences do a minor in philosophy or uh, history. Um, to give them some depth thing that's very, very different from the kind of uh, educational experience they're getting in their major. Um, and then we talked about process. So one thing, and I think the most important thing we all agreed on is that whatever the process is going forward, and as the provost said, I have no idea what she's got in mind, um, that it be widely collaborative and it involves student input. Uh, we met at one point with people from the Institute of Health uh, Design um, who do, st who do st um, human-centered design processes, and they talked a lot about ways of creating a, a process that would involve getting input from all kinds of stakeholders who have experience with our gen ed system as it is now, can identify what the problems are and where its shortcomings are and use that as a, as a beginning point to reflect on that. And we all thought something like that or some form of, of much wider consultation about the current system and where it's uh, falling short would be a helpful thing to do. Um, and then we thought it'd be important given uh, we all have a sense, uh, contrary to what the provost said, that in a lot of ways the gen ed system in, in its current form is not working and is not liked by anybody, uh, and in particular students. So one thought is that if you're going to re radically rechange it, it needs a new name and a kind of new branding strategy just so that students come at it with a different attitude and that that attitude is warranted. I mean, I, I think merely rebranding won't do anything. Uh, there has to be something new under there that you're trying to, to uh, describe. Um, we also suggested possibly starting with a pilot program. So I think any big change like this in a large university is going to have massive unforeseen consequences. So we hoped that A, uh, departments would be uh, protected from those consequences for a period of time as we figured out what this looks like, but also um, that it might help to sort of get a handle on what some of those consequences were if you did a small version of it first. Um, and then finally just pointing out that we will need to think about other mechanisms to create, to prevent the kind of backsliding into our inertial habits that um, any change to gen ed and any change to the way we educate our students is likely to create, right? We all have our habits um, of designing courses, of thinking about what a course is, about the way we teach, about the way we take classes, about the way we advise students to take classes. And if we're gonna radically change how we think about how education has to happen, um, it's going to be easy for that to fail if we all just go back to our habitual ways of doing things. And so figuring out how to avoid that if we want to go this route, um, we think is an important part of this process. Um, so I want to let my fellow cast members correct or, or weigh in and, and add anything I want to, uh, to what I said. But I first want to thank them all uh, for their work and, and the spirit in which I think we all did our work. I mean, one of the really pleasant and exciting and uh, good things about the discussions around the table was that we were all singularly focused on how to do our best to educate our undergraduate students. Um, and in these kind of conversations, that doesn't always happen. And so I want to both uh, thank my colleagues for uh, engaging in this exercise that way and hope that as we go forward, we can continue to engage in the, uh, this exercise that way. So um, let me stop there and see if anybody wants to add anything. Dale Reed, Computer Science. I just have a question for all of you. One thing that came up in our conversation was that there was some sense of dissatisfaction about gen eds. So I'm curious what you think. So let's vote. So very satisfied, please don't change anything. It's great, that's a five. Like, oh please, anything, let's change it. We really need to change it. That would be a zero. So I'm just curious, we can all vote at the same time. 
you want to abstain, don't raise your hand. I'm just curious how you feel about the current situation of gen ed here at UIC. And then look around, see what other people think. All right, thank you. Were there no fives? There were no fives. No fives. <laughs> Lisa, do you, let me just go down the table if you yeah, sure. feel um, free to pass. I, just. I'm Lisa Freeman. I'm a, from the College of Liberal Arts and Sciences and the English Department. Hey, good afternoon. My name is John Coombe Lilly. Uh, sure. Good afternoon. John Coombe Lilly, Clinical Associate Professor in the Department of Kinesiology, AHS. Hi, I'm Agustina Laurito. I'm an Assistant Professor at um, COPPA in the Department of Public Administration. Michael Thomas from the Department of Educational Psychology. Uh, I'm Sarah Ruth from the Department of Physics. And did any of you want to add anything to my quick summary? Air out some of our dirty laundry or? <laughs> no, no, I think, um, so I think um, I'm just starting to see some of the uh, questions that are streaming in um, via the Google Doc app. Um, so I think um, one of the things I want to kind of emphasize uh, from what Tony was saying is that we were not meant to think about specificities. Um, those are the kinds of things that will be hashed out should this process proceed. Um, and I think the thing to know is that um, while, while we were, we're all very committed to um, what um, we think of as um, the education of our students, we also had considerable disagreements, and those, I think, will come up again and again as we go through this process. Um, so um, any disagreements that, that you might have, we probably have already had on the, on the, in our task force, um, but you know, looking at the sort of uh, you know, hand poll, there was no one that's perfectly satisfied, and I saw a lot of twos and threes. So. Um, I think it behooves us to really try to think this through um, and think it through in an incredibly collaborative way across the campus. Um, so just want to put that out there. Anybody else want to? Sure. So one, one of the ways that I came to the committee in terms of the mindset was thinking about the drivers of change. And drivers of change political, social, technological. They're also the, the leaders' mindsets on our campus, the employees' mindsets, market requirements. And I think about these things. I also think about the fact that we're having conversations about people that are not in the room and potentially not even born yet. And um, a cursory reading of Education Week, which is essentially the weekly newspaper of K-12 education in this country, would give a, a very clear picture of who we're going to be working with. Education Next, which deals with K-12 policy, discusses the student experiences of the students we're actually thinking about our programs for. They've yet to come here. The drivers of change are just the ones we know now. And so within the room, and I want to echo Lisa, that we had significant differences in how we approach this. For myself, I came with it specifically from the drivers of change. The fact that um, information technology and the impact of technology isn't included directly in this report reflects the conflict. It was discussed, but we reach a conclusion that we present to you. So I just would like to let you know what Lisa said, that uh, yeah, we had it out, and there was no agenda coming in other than, hey, what's the best possible picture for our people that aren't here yet? Because the changes we're talking about won't affect the students we have today. It's the ones we're going to have tomorrow. And this is the big idea, I think, for me when I think about the changes in front of us. All right. Um, why don't we just open it up to questions? So, if you're gonna, if you would like to ask a question uh, in, in person, please use the mic. Uh, you can also uh, submit something on the Google Forms, and we'll get it up here, uh, and I can answer some of those if there aren't questions coming from the mic.
for the report. I want to piggyback off of what uh, John said. So I have a K-12 background, worked on an investing and innovation grant prior to here. We looked at a K-16 pathway pipeline, and we actually looked at dispositions um, rather than skills. And I'm curious, did that come up at all? So why skills and not maybe dispositions or practices or mindsets? Just curious. Or if it did come up, where does it sit in the thinking? Thank you. Um, well, thank you for that question. Um, I think, uh, again, that's a, that's a, that, that particular sort of uh, conceptual approach didn't come up in our conversations as I'm recalling it, um, but that doesn't mean it couldn't be part of future conversations. Um, and I think, you know, part of this is just, part of what, what the report is meant to do and what this session is meant to do is really just to get the conversation started across the campus to get people thinking about what they, what approach do they think might be um, appropriate for for general education, and um, I mean one of the things I would say is like the the general dissatisfaction about general education seems to, um, in large part, um, derive from the fact that it often just seems to be a kind of grab bag of courses. I'm going to take one from here, one from here, one from here without there being any kind of sort of metacognitive development around that, like what's the purpose of general education? How might these fields be related? And I think that's one of the things we were trying to get at by not breaking it down by disciplines. Um, so it could be dispositions, it could be capacities, it could be skills. Um, I think that's a conversation um, to be hashed out in future. But I think, again, this is um, trying to get folks on campus to think about um, what, what they think um, we should be talking about when we talk about general education, whether or not the campus goes forward with anything at all, or whether it's like, nope, too difficult a conversation to have, we're gonna back away. Um, so that, you know, that's the provost, um, that'll be up to her and her process, um, but we were just tasked with sort of putting some thoughts out there um, about it. I mean, I would say, on this sort of issue of skills versus capacities versus dis dispositions, it seems to me there are sort of two different decisions we as a campus would have to make here. One is, do we want to switch our gen general education curriculum from a model that is basically a distributional requirement model, that is, teach the stuff we're already teaching and make sure students take a wide variety of them? That's a standard way to do it. There are a lot of reasons why that's a good thing. Or do we want to imagine a curriculum that's a very different kind of curriculum that's aimed at teaching things that we all teach but being much more intentional about teaching those things as opposed to the subject matter that we tend to focus on when we teach in higher education. And if we go the second route, then there's a second conversation about, well, what exactly are those things? How do we carve up that space? Is it best to think of them as dispositions or skills or capacities? What's the difference between those terms in various theoretical and, and uh, educational you know, literatures? Um, what is it we're really getting at here? Which, and then of those, which are the ones that we are actually either equipped to teach or have the capacities to teach or are the right kinds of things to teach in something that looks like a college classroom? So, there are a lot of things that are really, really useful skills to have in life that I guess assume none of us feel like it's our, either our job to teach or that we're gonna be good at teaching or that the particular form of a three hour a week meeting with a set of students and assignments and things is the right space in which to learn those things. And so, you know, maybe those are things we ought not to have in, in, in our pile, whatever that pile is, and other things maybe we do. But I think, so there are these two conversations and we don't have to get into the weeds of the second one until we've seen the, whether we want to go that route at all and think about what the virtues and vices of doing so are. So, thank you. Sorry, Mike. Yeah. You want to take you it? Want to go? Uh, just a brief point. I think that part of our discussion was sort of a continual oscillation between the notion of incremental change and something that might be more radical and then trying to think through the implications of both. And that's not completely resolved. So thank you for your question. So um, one of my professors, Professor Torkelson's here, uh, I studied education psychology and graduated here with my doctorate, very proud of that. Your, um, 
your question about disposition, I think, is very important, but it raises to me two even larger issues, as far as I'm concerned. The first is the necessary information that we require from a, a diversity of sources to actually educate the professoriate and the decision makers at our institution about the possibilities of a better future for our students. That's the first thing. Second thing, that is also missing from the report, I sound like the contrarian up here, but the second thing that's missing is we actually don't know, as far as I know, what the impact, the quality, and the value is to our students and to our city. On the way over here, I noted Mayor Daly's quote, I don't know if you know it, it's on the corner of Holston and Harrison. A great university makes a great city. A great city makes a university. He said that apparently in 1963. It's there inscribed. And I'm wondering, what are we doing great already in Gen Ed? Because I did see some fours. What are we doing that's awesome already? How can we supplement that with even better practices and operations? And then how can we actually prove we're any good? That's, that's actually important to me. And then the third thing, I'd just like to say, tagging on to the provost, I've been here 15 years, 10 years in, as a faculty, five as a graduate. I'd like to think we're going to swim in our own stream whenever we can and measure our standards against ourselves. And I'm really frustrated as a faculty member being equated with other institutions that don't have our student body, don't connect with our city in this way. I think we need to be our own body with our own vision for our own future for our people. I think the Gen Ed is a place where we can establish the ideals and do something good for our city. I just want to comment along those lines as well. I think there is agreement among the committee uh, that many students and many faculty um, don't see gen eds as the highlight of their experience, but rather something to just be gotten out of the way. Wouldn't it be great if when students graduate, they think, wow, those gen ed courses, that's where it really all came together for me. That was, that was amazing, right? I mean, that could be true for us. Yeah, I want to, um, I'll kind of link this to some of the questions we're seeing that are coming over um, the Google, Google map. Um, there's a question from a student about why I have to do gen eds at all. Why can't I just my, do my major um, courses? There's a question about whether we can limit uh, education to three years rather than four years and just eliminate gen ed. So, um, so the answer to that, <laughs> that is, we, we've had that out. Um, there, there are, are people, folks on the panel who were advocating or at least plain devil's advocate for, advocate, for advocating to eliminate uh, gen ed and then there are those on the panel who are fervent um, supporters of a general education. And I think one of the things, again, that we're, we're trying to sort of bring to the foreground is, is the idea that, that Dale just shared, which is, that gen ed shouldn't be the thing we're just trying to get rid of. There should be a way for, for, for uh, students to understand that there is a relationship and a beneficial relationship between a gen ed course and the courses in their major. And one of the ideas floating through this document is an idea that gen eds are not just the things that you take when you're a freshman, get out of the way and never think about them again. Um, but that, that there's some kind of sort of um, course, uh, courses that you take across your career that are constantly building a kind of network of ideas, disciplines, concepts, so that you know, there, there's no discipline that only works on its, on its own terms. If you're going to be a physicist, you have to know some math, except, and if you're going to be a chemist or a physicist, you need to know some chemistry. So there are a lot of ways in which the disciplines are connected to each other, and the idea is to build a gen ed program that actually acknowledges that and thinks about what those connections are and makes this beneficial, not just, you know, we're just sending well-rounded people out into the world. That's not entirely the point, though some of us might argue that, in fact, that is. So I'm not dismissing that point, but for, there's a way to think about gen education that's not just kind of utilitarian in that way. Jeff, do you want to? Um, hi, I, I'm Jeff Gore. I'm from the English department, and I'm also the daughter of a 17-year-old. And <laughs> in the last year, I have visited <coughs> 15 different institutions. And so I could say for the most part, the chancellor is right in that, um, that our gen ed programs look very similar to what a lot of other institutions have. 
I can also say, however, there's a few. I don't know how radically they have changed this on the institutional level, but I can say there are a few that have really taken the leap to present it as if they have made this change. And I mean, one of the reasons why I think, I mean, just starting off with the frustration that undergraduates feel about this, because it just feels like maybe they get that it's a distribution, but maybe it, usually it's just that it's something to get out of the way. A few, college, a few institutions are able to use their gen ed program as part of how they market the school. And they do this, I, I think that the thing that stands out when they succeed at it is, the, is that they can succeed at presenting to a general public, people coming in from all majors, some parents who have been through a college education, some who have not, they can present that those courses and that experience is relevant. Now, I mean, all of us who teach gen ed classes, we believe in our hearts that our favorite subjects are relevant. That's why we do this thing. But the problem is, it's, it's partially an advertising thing, but partially it is, as Tony and other people have said, it's that it fits into other university habits and other university needs, and it's not really like, we will say, of course it is relevant, but it's also in part it's a place for us to find places to, to, to put students for a couple of years and places and jobs for faculty to do sometimes when they're not teaching graduate courses or their favorite courses. It's a thing for people to do at the very least, but it's not always what we say it is. Some ways that this does actually work out um, one of the solutions, I mean, in, with regards to what was marketed to me, like when you go to some of these institutions where they're really stepping this foot forward and when it works, you can hear in the room that everybody goes, ah, oh, that looks interesting. And it's not just people saying, can I take my courses at a community college and then move on. And some of the things that they do to make it look interesting, part of it is, having a, an experiential requirement that they really very well pair up with that gen ed experience. So they have an experiential education requirement that the student says, okay, I can find significant going to another country and studying there, or I can find significant um, having an internship, or I can find significant a, a service learning project, and then connecting your, your gen ed course experience to that. Um, something that a colleague of mine has suggested at another institution and has generally been laughed at is the idea that has been put forth here of putting those gen ed courses not all at the beginning, but really in the junior and senior year. So the freshman year, the courses that we call gen ed that would go there might include first year writing, might include um, foreign languages. Those things are skills that you gotta get out of the way to be able to do a lot of different majors, but also a lot of different general education experiences. You do those, those also help to initiate you into the university. Then you do your major, and then you come as a person with a major to that general experience where I've got two or three courses where I have relevant questions, and I bring that, and my study abroad, or internship, or service learning to that, and you're on kind of a problem-solving committee in your course. Now, this would be really, really, really hard to do <laughs> with the way we're doing things right now, but this, would, this is a way to think about it as a kind of experience that everybody in the room says, oh. And so, you know, it, it works on general education in terms of relevance, and the one thing then to sell it to the, I'm sorry, the one thing to sell it to the students is then just to say that you will, you know, take your major and you will have to be on committees and various other ways of solving problems. Thank you. Thanks, Jack. Um, any comments? We did discuss the experiential component uh, possibilities, right? We're in the city of Chicago, as John mentioned. What if some of our courses connected to the successes and challenges that are present in the city around us? Um, I just want to sort of bring in a couple of voices from uh, the Google Forum. So there are a number of questions about 
what I'll call logistics, though not to dismiss it. So um, b whether we considered uh, how students coming who are transferring to UIC would handle a gen ed uh, system or whether or not uh, these questions about, well, all I want to do is my major, why do I have to do gen ed as well? Um, questions from faculty and from others about how does this piece of uh, what UIC does fit with the fact that it's also a research university. Um, and I think the sort of short answer to a lot of those questions is we saw those as issues. We didn't take them up because we didn't take that to be our charge. We didn't, I think, have the expertise to handle them. But I think they're all really important. And once we have a vision of the perfect gen ed system in an ideal world, then there's an important question about how to make that a system that will actually work around the logistical facts of the lives of our students and our faculty. Um, but that, again, seems like a, a very important but downstream questions uh, to ask. I don't think we should uh, cut our sails at the beginning by saying, well, we need a system that will work equally well for transfer students and four-year students, though we're going to need a system that will equally work for them both at the end of the day. Okay, so I'm Dave Hoffman from Physics. Um, I had an observation and then a question. So on sort of the observational side, which is, um, you know, it's, it's an experience of one, which means I know statistically it has an error of 100%, right? <laughs> but this was my experience, and that was that um, um, although I, I, I only really appreciated general education about 15 years later. And, and I hated somehow having to take some of these courses. Why do I have to take a history course and a philosophy course? And, uh, you know, and um, you know, there, there, there was, you know, the economics course and a world religions course at the time. But I tell you, 15, 20 years later, those are the ones that I remember more. And so I just think in some of our thinking, we, we shouldn't just at least forget, and also to the students who are sort of stuck in our current system, it will pay off even if it's not perfect now in 15, 20 years, at least from my experience with a huge error bar of 100%. So that's just sort of an, uh, an observation, I would say. So we have to think both short-term but also long-term. And I think there are some, some long-term strengths here. So that, that sort of leads me to a question which was alluded to a little bit before, which is, in your deliberations, did you think about any major core things that are positive about our current gen ed system that you would want to preserve in some way? I mean, I don't know, did you think about that? Or was that really not part of it? Or maybe I'm not even thinking about this in the right way at all, because now you're just still anchoring yourselves to some current yeah. system. But I mean, I think that there, there's a reason we got here, and it's not all bad. And so was that folded in, or should that, you know, so how, how to yeah. include that? So I guess that's my question. Thank you. Does anybody want to? I'll give that one a shot. I mean, I think that, you know, one of the things that, um, so yeah, our, our entire gen ed program is not to be thrown out, but I think one of the things that a lot of us are aware of is that there are a lot of faculty who are teaching these amazing courses under the most banal headings. And, and so in a certain sense, um, someone from marketing might say, you have a, you have a marketing and branding problem. Um, so that the, the, the kind of exciting new classes, I'll just point to some of them that are in this new engaged humanities, um, curriculum. These are really exciting classes, um, and and a lot of what a lot of the the research that our faculty do and are bringing to the fore in their courses. A lot of the sort of amazing courses that they design are getting lost in this very sort of banal menu. Um, again, without any sense of there being any kind of linkage whatsoever between one course and the next. And I think one of the things for us to think about is how do we bring the research and all the disciplines that our faculty are doing and the courses that they're designing as a result to the fore. So it's clear what you, you know, what the kind of work is being done at UIC, what an amazing faculty we have and what amazing students we have engaging with that faculty so that there's a conversation going back and forth in these courses. And right now, I think there's a lot of dissatisfaction that that's not actually happening or if it is happening, it's not visible. And in that sense, it's not a felt effect either for faculty or for students. So I think that's one of the things we want to think about in rethinking gen ed. We have a lot of great faculty. We have amazing students. Why is there so much dissatisfaction? Part of it is not having that sort of reflective experience of what are we actually doing? How are we doing it? I would just add the sort of suggestion about the design model or other forms of um, 
gathering input would involve, I think, an, an important part of that is figuring out what people like about the gen ed, what they've gotten out of it, and, um, you know, we, we talk about not just uh, surveying students, but other stakeholders, including alumni, in part to, to get people who could say, well, I didn't get it at the time, but, you know, now, 15 years later, I see that this was really, really valuable. Um, so, yeah, I think that would be an important component to any uh, larger conversation. And, uh, and a huge part of this, of course, is the quality of the instruction and of the methods that are used in the course itself and not simply the content yeah. or the um, curricular category that they fall into. Yeah, I mean, just following up on that, I think, I mean, another way just to think about this is that there's the way you divide up the categories, um, there's the way the courses are taught, and there's the administration of that whole system. And you can think about our current system as succeeding or failing on any of those grounds and that only maybe some of them need to be changed, but my guess is to get all of them right, it's probably better to start from the ground up, though maybe I'm just missing the, the huge cost of doing that. Um, but you can have the best articulated system in the world, but if you don't retrain the faculty to teach classes in a way that's focused on that, it's not going to matter. And if you teach the, retrain the faculty, but you don't have an administrative system that keeps those new courses in place and doesn't allow departments to overload them with the courses that they already have on the books, it's not going to work. And so as we think through this, we need to think about all those things and not get hung up on, you know, well, I really, really care about the conceptual division of the categories. That has to be elegant and perfect and ignore that it's all going to go uh, wrong if you don't have um, the right administrative structure around it or the right teaching support around it. So just, just to add to that, we, we think that there are fantastic faculty here. Try this idea, Ron. What if, when we hired every single faculty member in the future that was going to engage with Gen Ed, that they served a one-year apprenticeship on how to deliver a kick-ass Gen Ed program, working with highly skilled existing faculty, but dedicated to an unbelievable gen ed expression. And I think this is also tied to this idea that we had of a separate entity on our campus that could harvest the best practices that we currently have. Thank you. I have um, a number of thoughts swimming around in my head, but I think I'll start here. And that's to say when I teach a history 272, 20th century China, I don't think gen ed versus major. I have everybody in that class, from business to nursing to teaching of history to history majors to, they're all there. And I think we need to remember that gen ed isn't something separate, but it's something we all do and we do it together um, with students who are in our, in our majors. And those majors bring something to the other students and the other students I think also bring something to those majors. The other thing I was thinking about um, early on, particularly in light of the discussion of, of skills, analyzing arguments, marshalling evidence, we all do this. But if we're on humanities, social sciences, natural sciences, we do this differently. And so we can't make one mush <laughs> course where we do that. I think it's really important that students are exposed to the methods, arguments, and evidence in different different fields, different disciplines, because it helps them to be flexible thinkers, and it helps them to understand maybe how somebody else can legitimately think about a problem or a question differently than they might do. So I think that's, I think that's quite important. Um, I also wanted to say, well, I think it's, it's fantastic to have these conversations, and I think we need to have conversations about teaching, too, to have everybody start to teach in the same way is not necessarily going to be a good thing. I remember about 15, 20 years ago, I was writing an application for some teaching award that somebody had dreamed up in the college. And what I was impressed by when the student letters came in for my department is how they got very different things from very different instructors with very different teaching styles. And so I think there's an element of that that we want to retain. That doesn't mean everybody should 
just go back to doing things the way they have been doing. But I, I think that that kind of diversity, too, um, is, is very valuable. And I'll stop there, but I just wanted to throw a few of those, those ideas out while they were burning hot. Thank you. I, I wanted to comment. I thank you for that comment on, on teaching styles. And Ed had put a, uh, a question or comment in here about that learner-centered instruction is something that's important. And I think as different faculty members, we certainly have different approaches and personalities as we teach, but it would really be wonderful if we can choose from all the best options as opposed to just sort of settling what we happen to know already. So I think that we have an opportunity as a university to share our best, best practices with each other that we have not fully explored so far. I, okay, go ahead. Um, I would like to also thank you for the comment about um, interdisciplinarity and um, students benefiting from being with other majors because that's something that we talked a lot about. It's, it's especially important for me. I am in a very interdisciplinary field and I see the benefits of um, being exposed to the ways other, um, other disciplines or other majors think about problems and approach those problems and, and how they apply maybe the same um, the same approach in like, oh, how do we think about cause and effect, but they may be thinking about it in a different way. And I, uh, I think that's one of the things that we talked about and I especially value about our conversations. Um, <clears throat> Kouros Mohamedi on civil and materials engineering. Uh, I think um, everybody agrees that genets are important. Nobody actually thinks that we have to take them away. And most people agree that we need to realign them to make sure that they serve the purpose. They cover the topics and skills that they are supposed to actually cover. My question is whether the panel uh, looked into the optimum level of uh, Janet courses in terms of number of hours that we have to offer. When I started actually here at UIC, I know that in addition to two English courses, 160 and 161, the requirement was five Janet courses that one course could have actually even counted toward actually two different categories. So technically our student actually just could get by by taking four Janet courses plus two English courses. Now the requirement is six. I had a quick search through the actual IBHE programs that are approved, that are basically in Illinois. I have seen many programs that actually got approval. The requirement is only 16 hours of Janet courses. So I don't know, I don't say actually that 16 is optimal. I don't say that actually our 24 hours is optimal. But I know that this actually kind of puts burden, a little bit actually just pressure on departments because we have to satisfy certain requirement courses, required courses for the industry that we are actually, our graduates are serving and they are asking us to offer courses in those areas and there is no way for us actually to, to offer them because 24 hours is dedicated to, gen to Janet. It's important, but I'm saying that is there any way that we can actually through the realignment, we can also look into the number of hours that we are offering. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm gonna come to addressing your uh, question uh, before that, I just want to say something. Uh, Dave Hoffman is my best friend, period. My best friend in the whole world. And um, every, every evening we have a dedicated at least half an hour where we talk in our safe space. Nobody knows about what we talked about. Um, but apparently we're going to have a lot more conversations about this. Dave just said that the best things that he remembers from his um, undergraduate is, you know, the, you know, I, and I agree with what he's saying, why he had to learn history and everything. But I, I'm going to make a counter argument. Again, it's a data point of uh, one, uh, but I am so glad that I was able to take many body theory of solids and real analysis as an undergraduate because that helps me immensely in the kind of research that I do. And it affects the grants that I bring to UIC and the research that I'm able to provide for my students. So the thing that I'm tr trying to say here um, the gen ed courses that you take, and I am not at all uh, arguing that we should not be having them, uh, are always coming at the expense of something. Just to give you an idea as a addressing, uh, a physics BS, uh, BS uh, degree is 120 credits, 80 of them only are in physics. And um, so just to give you an idea, you know, I said this in our um, uh, uh, meeting, I mean, one of the most, 
Electromagnetism is one of the most fundamental theories of uh, modern uh, physics, classical physics, built 150 years ago or more. One of the tenets is that a charged particle radiates. I'm not able to teach that to my students because the part where I'm supposed to teach it is in the second part of a course, which they're not even required to take. And when I found out about this, I said, why can I can't I teach this? How can a student who gets a Bachelor of Science from UIC not, in principle, have to learn uh, radiation? It's because there's so many courses to take. So nobody doubts the value of Janet in terms of making a well-rounded person. I, I'm, you know, uh, during the course of those uh, five months with my colleagues, I actually had very interesting conversations with my wife. I did not do Janet. Other than take, taking Turkish history and Turkish language in my institution, all my courses were all physics. I'm actually very happy that I had that chance. For some reason, I don't think I'm not well-rounded. You know, I might be full of myself, but I, I think I mean, we shouldn't always be expecting everything to come from the lectures, from the courses that we take. We make ourselves uh, well-rounded in many different ways. I mean, this I did in the 90s. Now, oops, sorry. Nowadays, I think for a student to make themselves well-rounded, there are so many different routes. The thing that I want to bring is exactly addressing, this was the part that I somehow contributed, giving the departments more freedom in determining what uh, a good education means, rather than a set of values that applies to a very general crowd. But I might have different needs as far as addressing my physics or chemistry students' needs. I'm not overlooking their well-roundedness, but I also want to be able to teach them something that I believe that a physics undergraduate student with a degree from UIC should know. And I'm not able to do that right now. So this is addressing not general. I'm, I don't want to take Janet from UIC in any shape or form. But I also should have some freedom to be able to teach my students what I believe is important in their major. And that needs to be kind of uh, balanced. It's kind of like almost addressing. It's a very small set of students. But it's addressing a minority of students that actually need this type of higher learning in their own fields. Not necessarily for the general crowd, but whatever reform we make in Janet should somehow address those people that are on the margins. And in, this is a funny kind of margin. margin <laughs> marginalized students who really want to learn a lot more in their major. Yeah, so I think here there are two different, again, two different questions. Sorry, I'm a philosopher. I always divide things into, you know, just, I make distinctions. Um, two different questions here that are important. One is the logistical one of, you know, there are only so many credit hours we can require our students to take, and so they, you know, adding gen ed takes away from other things they can do, adding requirements in majors takes away from things they can do, and so forth. So there's a balancing act there. But part of the way to begin to figure that out is to articulate to ourselves more clearly what it is we're doing in educating our undergraduates generally and what function gen ed play, plays in that role. Um, so that you can then think about how, whether gen ed is balancing the work in a major or, or enhancing the work in a major or doing something different. Uh, and so, you know, I think both of those qu conversations have to happen. We spent more time on the one about what we were doing rather than the numbers because we weren't at that level of detail. Well, but I don't, I, but that's going to depend on what it is we think we're doing, and it's probably going to be, you know, good enough. It's <laughs> the best we're going to get. I'm a big fan of satisficing as well. Yeah. Hi, I'm Cynthia klein -Benai. I lead the Office of Sustainability here. Um, and I do commend you on your work and um, the ideas you've brought up. Um, I would be a sample of two with David in terms of a lot of what I learned came in to serve me later in my career. Um, I'm an environmental scientist, but have work. I need all kinds of skill sets to do the work I do here. Um, 
and we have many students that are interested in solving these big world issues and they need the skill sets to think about them across whatever discipline they're in. We argue for that across the disciplines um, uh, to be able to understand the world in such a way that they can think about it. Those are the ideas that you did bring up earlier, sort of systems thinking and the critical issues that we have of the time. So. Um, I, I also wanted to share that our office, in terms of assessing where the university is with sustainability, have done inter inventories of the curriculum using the minimal information that's available in the course catalog to try to categorize courses as to whether they're related or focused on the sustainability issues and things like that. Um, we've also done surveys, and if that's of any use as this process goes on, we're happy to share that information more broadly. So thank you. We have about 10 minutes left. Is there, was there any questions from the Google feed that anybody wanted to? Well, there seem to be a lot of questions about transfer students. So um, I just want to um, say that um, um, we have a variety of articulation agreements that I think are um, uh, particular to the entire state. So um, any kind of um, gen ed curriculum that we would design needs to be sensitive to that issue. It can be um, a system that uh, denies access uh, to transfer students. So I, that's not, that's kind of, wasn't our charge, but I think it's something um, when we talk about accessibility uh, or access to education, um, understanding that a lot of our students, our transfer students are taking um, the equivalent of gen eds at community colleges, that'll be something that'll have to get hashed out um, and negotiated by looking at what those articulation agreements are, um, seeing what we come up with and see if those things can speak to one another, but it certainly can't be something that denies access. Um, I think that's a basically state mandated. <laughs> so um, even if we wanted to do it, we couldn't. So um, just wanna be clear about that. Hi, Stacey Horn at Psych. Um, I, I apologize, I haven't read the report, and, but how I'm hearing you talk about the system, it feels very sort of unidimensional, uh, like it's a system, right? There's one system, there's a set of categories or dispositions or skills, and I'm wondering if you talked at all about creating a multidimensional system so that you could even think about like mapping pathways for students around like, okay, curricularly you want people to do physics, so could there be a pathway that they're getting some of the dispositions through the physics classes, for example? So, so students could kind of choose a, a, a kind of a constellation of courses, which gets to your point about building on each other, right? And that, but it'd have to be a multidimensional system. So I, I just wasn't hearing that coming out, and I was wondering if that was part of your conversation. I, think, I mean, it was a little bit. I think, again, we were trying, we were tasked not with coming up with a proposal of a system, but some ideas, and so, I, I mean, as we were developing these ideas, an idea, uh, sort of more full-blown system that occurred to me that I sort of liked was one that would involve both uh, something like skill-based courses that you would take early on, and then these a kind of capstone project course at the end that would have this other this function of collaborating across disciplines. But that requires. You know, there's no point in getting a bunch of undergraduate students to collaborate across disciplines unless they have training in those disciplines. So that's a thing to have them do at the end of their major, not at the beginning. But then it feeds into, well, why should a physics major take a gen ed course? Well, because what you want to do is see how bringing physics to something other than physics problems in a physics class is a useful thing and how to do that and how that's different from just answering physics questions in a physics class. Um, so yeah, I, I think a system that was multidimensional would be a good way to think about it. So, yeah, John. There was a note. Hey, Stacey, thanks for that. Um, so it, there was an idea floated, which was <clears throat> thinking about the charge of like, where would we be in 2045 and the use of artificial intelligence and the use of technologies that we already know about now. So imagine a gen ed portal where a student enters the gen ed portal and then once they're introduced to what it is that's in front of them, that they follow a, an adaptive learning process within a gen ed portal that could take them across disciplines, okay? And there's some big implications for that because you might not need a faculty member. Just saying. <laughs> yeah. 
any of us want to weigh in? Or any questions from the Google Duck or yeah? So I, I wanted to go back to um, Lisa's uh, point about accessibility and the question about transfer student. And even though that's something that it's, we are not tasked to design a specific process or design a specific um, system, uh, we did try to be mindful of um, the students that we have at UIC and the students that will keep coming to UIC. Um, and I think like any uh, process moving forward would, should have that as uh, something that's central. And in thinking about that and uh, about transfer student, keeping accessibility and not adding additional burdens to um, or students that are um, coming in from maybe from community colleges or from other situations, I think that's something that would be important. Um, any final comments before we wrap up? So um, I want to thank everybody for uh, participating in this. I hope this conversation goes uh, forward in this kind of spirit that it happened today uh, as the provost announced what the next steps are. Um, I also want to put in a plug for something that I'm doing uh, not connected to this, but related to, related to topic-wise, just to see if there are any volunteers. I run a center that does work in philosophy of education, and we're thinking about a project that would involve teaching in gen ed classes, and we were trying to recruit faculty here. And it, uh, Wisconsin Madison, who would who regularly teach large intro classes that count for gen ed credit, who would like to think about uh, new ways of teaching them uh, that would make them more uh, based on a set of skills, teaching a set of skills or capacities that uh, you think students would want to learn and what that would look like. Um, so if you're at all interested in getting involved with that, uh, you can either come talk to me now or email me at Layden at uic.edu uh, if you're not in the room. Um, and I'll get back to you. Thanks. And thank you, everybody, for uh, this conversation. Thank you.